So uh, we have uh, Mos Zhao and Patricia Clement, and they will be speaking to us about podcasting 101. So uh, Mos has a PhD from a couple of years ago uh, from the University of Oxford, and his current research interests include arterial spin labeling, PET MRI, and deep learning. And he's passionate about open science and communi science communication. Uh, Patricia is a PhD student uh, at Ghent University, working on physiological variability of uh, also arterial sp spin labeling, ASL bids, and also involved in the cost action Glimmer 2.0, which is about advanced MRI for glioma. Um, so welcome to the both of you. Um, I'll share my screen, which is an intro slide to your talk. But other than that, you are welcome to start off the discussion. All right. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to begin my talk by thanking the organizing committee to invite us to share our experience with you today. Uh, my name is Moss Zhao, and I'm currently a postdoc researcher at Stanford University. I am very, very delighted to share my experience on making science podcast with you. And uh, I'm Patricia Clements. I'm, a, as, as uh, you already said, a PhD at Ghent University. Uh, to be honest, I have no experience at all with creating post podcasts. Uh, however, I've been invited to talk in one a uh, couple of months ago. Uh, so I can tell you more about that side of the story. Of course. So today our aim um, is to share our experience on making science podcast. Uh, so we would like to take a very creative approach by making our presentation into a podcast. So we will be asking each other questions about how to produce a successful podcast and popular podcast from an interviewer and an inter interviewee's perspective. So Mos, you are creating podcasts for ESM RMB. How did you come up with this idea and how many podcasts did you create already? Sure. Well, I mean, maybe let me begin by just introducing uh, ESMRMB uh, for those of uh, the audience who, who are not familiar with the organization. So ESMRMB is the uh, largest uh, MRI organi organization uh, for researchers uh, in Europe. And as a member of the Early Career Researcher Committee, uh, we have made, I think, more than five podcasts for, um, for ESMRMB to promote open science and knowledge exchange. Uh, we developed this idea about a year ago, just after when everyone started working from home. And the goal was basically to enhance science communication and to enable everyone to find out what's going on in other colleagues' life around the world. And at first we didn't have a, you know, a lot of idea or a lot of experiences on making podcasts, but we listened to some examples on, on YouTube and to try to understand the style of the speech and the types of questions that would interest other people. So in general, I would say it is, it is a good idea to ask you know, open-ended questions that can trigger more deeper discussions. And additionally, we also found it more effective to keep each question short, uh, let's say within two or three minutes. Uh, I mean, the question and answer within two or three minutes, um, just like what we are doing here now. So I guess the first step for each podcast is thinking about an interesting topic, right? So I, I was wondering, how do you do this? That's, that's exactly right. Well, usually in, in the beginning, we select a, a handful of topics, including, for example, MRI history or career development, technology transfer, or even science collaboration, etc. And we also approach a few speakers who expressed interest in making a podcast with us. And during our discussion, we actually found that they were very excited to share their stories and the response was very, very positive. And after we produced a, a trial episode, we received a lot more interest from uh, other colleagues and researchers who would like to be featured in our podcast. So we were very excited that our podcast could 
bring people together, um, especially during during the lockdown, uh, and to allow researchers to continue to exchange ideas and, and knowledge. Uh, therefore, we expanded the scope of the topic to include you know, more, more things such as uh, fellowship applications, work-life balance, or even just tips on um, how to uh, participate in a successful virtual conference and so on. And nowadays we are very open to even more ideas. For example, we are in the process of making a series of uh, episodes for early career academics who just recently started their own lab because we believe that um, we hope to give them the opportunity to promote their new ideas or to recruit uh, new students and uh, postdocs uh, from around the world. Uh, so it is also a good idea to, I mean, to create you know, some special episode, for example, themed uh, for special occasions. For example, um, we recently produced a um, podcast with uh, the Glioma uh, MRI imaging group of the Cost Action uh, in Europe on this year's World Cancer Day in, in February. And also we have plans, for example, later in, in this year to, to make a podcast on such as post-mortem uh, MRI on Halloween, for example. So these is um, just a lot of freedom and opportunities uh, for a variety of topics to, to include. Yes, well, there are very interesting topics. Um, so you have a topic now, then what happens next in the production of a podcast? Uh, can you maybe share some experience in this process of making an episode, for example, how long does it take you? What factors do you have to consider? Of course. Um, well, um, I, I wouldn't say it, it takes a lot of effort to, to produce a podcast with the help of modern technology. Um, so there are probably four or five uh, things, main things during the process for a podcast of say 15 minutes. And first of all, we we always need to contact the speaker maybe about two or three weeks in advance to arrange a time and touch base with the topic and the communication platform such as using Zoom or Microsoft Team or other um, virtual meeting uh, software. And then um, we would send speakers some questions that we think uh, are interesting but also at the same time, we are happy to ask them, um, you know, if they have any um, any questions that we are always uh, welcome to um, to include. And after we confirm with the speaker about the questions and the time and the date of the podcast, we would start a meeting and then make a recording. And of course, you know, with the help of, of the technology, we can always make adjustment depending on the, the actual recording. We can even re-record uh, certain segments. And um, so very often this, this process of recording the podcast takes place for about an hour until um, all of us are happy with the, uh, with the recording. And then, um, you know, one of us would, uh, usually the production uh, team would uh, edit the recording with some just free software such as Audacity uh, on Windows or, or, or iMovie on Mac before just uh, sharing it with our speakers for, for approval. And um, usually they are all very um, easy and uh, intuitive to use the, the softwares. And finally, it's just the most exciting part, uh, which is to, to release our product on different platforms such as Spotify or Anchor, and actually they are all like interconnected. So once we share our podcast on one platform, we are able to um, make it uh, visible on other several other platforms. Uh, and also we, we often uh, tweet our latest uh, uh, episodes on Twitter and then also make it available on our LinkedIn and often you know retweet our previous episode for people who who recently joined our community. Well, of course, you, you will need a good platform to share the podcasts. Um, and, and then how do you get feedback to your podcast or your episodes? Can you see how many people listen to it? 
Well, that's that's a very very good question. Uh, indeed, uh, the I mean the, the information or the feedback on our podcast is extremely extremely useful for us to uh, to adjust the topic or to uh, plan things in the future. And uh, fortunately, we are able to monitor the the viewing progress on all the platforms that we host our podcast, such as on Anchor or, or Spotify, uh, as I mentioned. For example, since I think since September last year, over 300 people from 20 countries have played our podcast on Anchor. And the majority of our listeners are between 25 to 50 years old. And I believe this is an excellent way of disseminating the knowledge of um, uh, MRI in general in a very casual and, but also a direct way. And actually a lot of our um, ESMRMB members actually told us that they often listen to our podcast while they are cycling or doing exercise. Well, then I guess that many members of the ESMRMB already listen to your podcast. But I was wondering, do you advertise the episode somewhere else? How, how do you do this? And uh, maybe do you think this has some impact to attract other people as well? Yes. Uh, so we, we take advantage of most of the social, uh, social networks, such as Twitter, LinkedIn, or, or YouTube. Um, here, I would also like to, to reflect the, the principles of using Twitter that uh, Veronica just shared with us in the, in the previous talk. Uh, we often schedule our tweet in the morning so that you know, people can, can see it uh, immediately uh, when they wake up to check their mobile phone. And we also like to include a picture uh, from, uh, from the researcher that we interviewed to make it uh, more attractive. And of course, we, we often retweet our previous uh, episode to allow our new followers to find out uh, what we discussed uh, in the past. And I think the same goes uh, for LinkedIn, uh, but this is in LinkedIn, I think the, the majority of our um, viewers or listeners are either like company uh, representatives or even uh, recruiters. Uh, and I believe this is uh, very, very useful uh, for, for example, potential uh, job seekers to, uh, to become uh, more popular or in an advantage position in the job market. Okay, cool. Uh, then I was wondering for you personally, what is, in your opinion, the biggest advantage of creating these podcasts, as I assume that it is quite uh, time consuming, right? Right, I mean, a, a little bit, but uh, for me, it's always very, very enjoyable. And uh, because on one hand, I have the opportunity to meet uh, different scientists who are also very passionate in science communication. And on the other hand, I was able to improve my um, interpersonal skills or speaking skills, which I believe are extremely, extremely useful in a modern uh, academic career. And, and also I think Patricia, since we just collaborated on an episode together for the glioma MRI cost action, uh, could you maybe share your experience on how you prepared to give a uh, successful podcast from an interviewee's perspective? Yes, indeed. Well, uh, I would like to thank you again for that opportunity. It was a, a fun experience. Um, so what happened is that uh, Esther Warner, who is our chair, the chair of uh, Glimmer, and I, we did a podcast in light of the World Cancer Day in February. Um, so after your invitation, we sat together and uh, we started thinking about what we wanted to share with the audience about our cost action. And that helped us a lot in preparing some que questions and answers. Um, for example, who we are, which events we organize, of course, uh, how you can, whoever you can join our cost action. And then uh, we started fine tuning the answers, but we mainly did it in bullet points. I think um, preparation is key. But I also think that the uh, podcast needs to be a little fun and informal. So we chose not to write, write, write down our answers explicitly. Um, this way, there's still some room for some error, which might be funny. And uh, afterwards, you contacted us. And then we did a recording for the episodes. Uh, and it was yeah, actually quite a fun experience. So um, yeah, that's it. Oh, that's so interesting to, to hear. Uh, I'm sure it, it's super helpful for our future uh, episodes. 
uh, to, to learn from your uh, experience. Um, and also, we, we just discussed the delivery of a podcast from a producer's perspective. So could you tell us some tips uh, that you found useful and there, as an interviewee, such as what things you found uh, helpful when we did the recording? I think the most important tip, uh, invest in a good microphone. <laughs> Uh, it's it's uh, an issue I think many of us experienced already and it became more important uh, during the last year because everybody's now doing everything digitally. <laughs> Remy, yes. <laughs> Uh, to be honest, uh, I still need to buy uh, some good microphone, but uh, it was really annoying to hear uh, my own voice afterwards because the recording was very crappy. Um, and I was actually quite lucky that that you had some time left to redo the recording, um, uh, which made, made the podcast better. Um, maybe my second advice would be, uh, it's something which is a little bit in line with other talks of today, try to keep it simple. You don't have to overload the interview with very complex ideas or very uh, difficult scientific words. Uh, just try to make it fun. Uh, podcasts are a great way to disseminate uh, your research to reach a broader public. Um, and I, uh, most of you today, mo many people I said, uh, try to explain it like you explain it to your mother. Well, I always use the example, try to explain it. So you explain it to your grandmother, um, at least, that way most people will already understand it and um yeah just have fun well that that's great that's amazing um so i think uh that's that's uh what we uh have uh, to share and uh it is time maybe for us to to open the floor to our audience uh but we before we take any any questions i would just like to say that uh if if you are interested in making a podcast with our team on, on any topic that you would like to share about, uh, please uh, get in touch with me. And I think you can find my, uh, my Twitter account on the, uh, on the slide and, uh, and feel free to, to DM me there. Uh, yeah, and you, you can include any animals uh, or pets that you like. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really, really fun. Really love that format. I really love the you yes. decided to just jump in and just have a sort of a live podcast episode in the middle of the conference. That is pretty, really cool. Um, how I think we, we have a question to... from from my, from Myra. Did I? Is it? Yes, if it's possible, I think you can hear me. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for the talk or this discussion. It was very nice to hear. I'm from BQ Minded a Project. That is an EU-funded one. And uh, as one of the tests for our project, we are creating a podcast now. Uh, and we are going to release now in April 1. And I have a question related to the interviews. Do you share the topic and the questions beforehand with the interviewee? Because... Uh, I don't know how, how you handled that. I've heard different things from people with podcasts, like should you share already all the questions or should you leave it uh, like more natural conversation for the recording? Right, uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, and I think we had the same uh, concern in the beginning while we were just navigating uh, the, the uh, most effective way of making a, a successful podcast. Uh, so I think according to our experience of just making let's like, five or six, uh, six podcasts, uh, it, it's, it was more effective to at least set the scope and the uh, general theme of the discussion with our, uh, with our speaker. And of course, during the process, uh, we always welcome more discussions or even more questions uh, from the speaker or as we uh, discuss during the, uh, the recording process. And one thing that uh, we uh, often keep in mind is time, uh, because like I said in, in my talk, uh, we, we usually aim the, the, the podcast to be around 15 minutes. So um, if our speaker uh, can uh, know or can find out the questions or the uh, the topics in advance, then maybe uh, he or she can better prepare uh, their answers and make the uh, recording more smooth. 
Uh, but of course, I agree that uh, having some kind of surprising uh, questions or impromptu discussion would always make the uh, the episode more exciting and uh, more, I think, popular uh, among uh, people who don't actually know the, uh, the the speakers. Yeah. Yes. Yes, because I think it depends a lot on on who is the the aim audience. Also, if you want to. Uh, have already for for researchers that have a lot of knowledge on the field and they want more details you need to prepare something different than if it's for a wider public so yeah right. thank you very much of course